And may I say, darling, you look super handsome today. Well, I'm glad I'm recovered. Thank you. Hey, everybody, Conscious Medium, Brandon Ross, and you are here for another episode of Stream of Consciousness. And, you know, I really pride myself on connecting with people of all walks of life, no matter where they are on their path. And sometimes you meet people that just really kind of stand out for what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I felt it really important to have our next guest on. Mitch is coming to us in the middle of his path. And sometimes we bring people to you that are like, hey, here's my product. And hey, here's this. Hey, here's that. But Mitch has a very unique way about how he's approaching his path, both in self-healing as well as what he's finding his purpose for in this world. And I thought this would be the perfect stream of consciousness because it really speaks to where a lot of people are in their path. And uh, Mitch, how do you like that for an introduction here? Uh, I think that's fantastic. My feathers right. feel ruffled. <laughs> did, did, did you wet yourself a little bit? Nah, maybe. I did. It was that good. <laughs> Anyways, so Mitch, tell us a little bit about like, you know, where I, you know, I hate to go all the way back into the, you know, when you were at Zygo, but when did you realize you were on a spiritual path and what did it feel like? Uh, thinking back to it, I think I might've been on it since I was five years old. Okay. If I'm being honest, because, you know, I grew up uh, Jewish and uh, my family actively goes to temple to this day. And mm -hmm. For whatever reason, when I was five, I just didn't want to be there. I didn't know why, but oh. yeah, I definitely got into a lot of trouble with that type of attitude. Well, was it like an anti disestablishmentarianism type of thing, or did you just really feel like this doesn't serve a purpose? Like, like what was the vibe? Was it I hate my parents, or was it I don't really buy into this? Like, where did you fall? I definitely didn't hate my parents, but um, mm -hmm. I would say like they, they will be watching. I know they, they definitely will be and laughing. Um, I'd say it's probably more an establishment type thing. Um, right. I don't know, just having a rebellious nature. I was always that kid that was like a fireball, like family gatherings on the okay. playground. So like, I think that kind of is like part and parcel. Of like, I don't want to sit still and listen to this strange music and people chanting and stuff. Well, it, it also kind of speaks to the development of like where you are in your path, right? I mean, you know, that kind of that that spring loaded ass that you're talking about, like we all kind of had it when we were younger and we we're just like, I don't know what this is, but I don't like it. And I got to go. How did you kind of start to meld that into, OK, I got to go search for purpose? Like when where did you start going to with that? I would say that, like, I kind of just meandered my way into finding it. Um, I've always had like some not good choices with friends. and so that led to a lot of interesting trauma and a lot of interesting ways of coping with it. Yeah. So I think like I really started to dabble in like meditation and different techniques in college for okay. like the old dabbler, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, what did that so, look like though? I mean, cause you know, college is a time of experimentation. Like you're, you're going to do stuff that you couldn't do, you know, when, when, when they were bringing you to temple on the weekend, you had to kind of like, measure your kind of like curiosities if you will then when you're away at college you're like yeah sure i went to temple like you know you could say whatever you wanted because you knew you could sleep all the way through saturday what did that yeah. look like for you like where where did you start to really kind of you know talk about things from everything from expansion to kind of understanding that kind of spiritual journey i just started diving into this sort of stuff yeah. Um, on the internet, I'm just doing random research into like meditation and it's honestly very fuzzy for me because I was a completely different human being back then. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I wasn't happy. A lot of my class dropped out. This is right around the 2008 market crash where oh, yeah. like, let's talk about that. That's, that's cool. So yeah. what, how did you cope with the market crash? I mean, I came from, you know, a fortunate scenario. So I didn't really think about it. You know, I was okay. 18 years old at the time with this like sort of uh, punkish, like emo kid, like attitude. Right? right. So 
Um, I don't think I really thought about it all that much, but oh. I certainly felt it when half of the incoming class, including my two best friends, um, dropped out because tuition was too expensive. Right. Yeah, and it's funny here in 2023. I mean, we're starting to see some of those economic pressures again, but for different mm -hmm. reasons. And it's funny, you, you've got from an astrological standpoint, you have Pluto had just gone into Capricorn. Now it's heading out of Capricorn and we seem to have similar economic pressures. I mean, you know, having a having a 16 year old kid and, and he's a marginal student on his best day running downhill with nothing but gym class to take. Um, I'm here to tell you, I'm not writing a check for an education he's not going to show up for because he doesn't show up for the one I don't pay for. Um, but I, I, I think that's really important because um, economists actually talk a lot about how that generation, that kind of 2007 to 2010, 11, like really lost out because they didn't work until 2012, 2013. So you searched, did you search for a job for a long time? And how do you think that played into your spiritual journey? I didn't actually. I had a lot of different like summer gigs, okay. doing like temp work and that kind of stuff, uh -huh. and that didn't last very long because I started an internship with the healthcare system that my dad worked for. Okay. So I brought, got brought in to basically update and maintain floor plans and databases and use a little bit of graphic design too. Uh, I'm sorry. What you were <laughs> you were doing schematics. Well, I mean, like, is that what you dreamed about doing in college? I couldn't make up my mind. I wanted to be an right. architect. I wanted to do graphic design. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to study music. It's going to be great. <laughs> and there it is. There it is. That's why us musicians hang out with each other all the time. Like, <laughs> just in case we're ever unemployed and it's going better for you, I'm going to go work for you. And at least, you know, the lunches will be hot. That's the good thing, right? But, you know, just in terms of like a generational thing, like what were some of the things that your friends had to go through? Because this was at a time where, you know, this is when like the banks were too big to fail. Crap was going on in, in, in a societal manner. Personally, you were sheltered a little bit, it sounds like. But, you know, that still kind of leads to something where it's like you were still getting something out of this and you weren't being fulfilled. How did you start to how do you even explore music or creativity during this time? I would say that like I listened to a ton of music always um, yeah. and yeah, I was really it, my music taste evolved once I discovered music I wasn't supposed to listen to according to my parents like that kind of just like set me on this trajectory. all hail yep keep yeah going. Um, I went from like blink 182 to God smack the slip not to Meshuga in like short order like five years sounds like a natural progression to me that's actually that's actually chord progression <laughs> just to let you know <laughs> Core progression. Michigan. Yeah. So, but, but still though, with that, was there something, you know, you brought up the, you know, the Jewish background of being in synagogue and now you're like totally, you know, rebellious within the confines of like, I mean, listen, listening to Slipknot, which was an evocation of like self-pain, self-loathing. I mean, basically it was a running 27 club. I mean, every single one of their tunes, even when, um, you know, when Taylor went, went over and did, you know, Stone Sour, it was still like they were angry. They were talking about mm -hmm. getting over and getting, standing up and being able to be like, forget your, you know, forget your stuff. And, and whether you're talking about, you know, um, you know, going sovereign or um, psychosocial, you, you were dealing with generational issues there did you find that to be like what you were being connected to um i think a little bit in, in like an indirect way here's here's why right a lot of my friends most people who are my age have to take out student loans right so there's all these loans there's expensive tuition right. a lot of friends are leaving so that left me in a pretty sad state um and yeah, you know, I had gone through a pretty rough, abusive type friendship scenario for like the last two years. So I think oh, wow. that left me with a lot of trauma that got reopened when a bunch of people left. Uh, so and, and, and you I know, think, that can actually reflect in like what kind of art you're going to pay attention to, you know, whether it's, you know, angry Monet stuff. I know it exists. 
or if it's, you know, deeper, darker, heavier music, you still kind of went through that. What, what do you think your epiphanies were when you realized like, and by the way, that's an age of Piscean thing where you're like, hey, you're my buddy, you're my pal. And you have kind of that codependency friendship stuff because that's what we're kind of trained to do. What did you what you learn out of that from a spiritual standpoint? What'd you learn about it? Um, that nothing is ever certain. Oh. <laughs> nothing is ever certain. And, um, you know, friendships shift, change, evolve. People grow apart. And that's more of like 10 years worth of pondering this stuff where yeah. I've actually gotten to experience some of those things. But then uh, to me, there's the strongest connections I have with people are people that I don't see maybe more than like once every year at most. Mm. And like those connections are still going strong, but some of the people I saw a lot, I don't hear from, they're just followers on Instagram and like, not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but just people grow apart because of either distance, um, moving to a different state, going to a different school, that sort of stuff. Um, and there's definitely friendships that stuck with me because uh, yeah, my two best friends from college, they got married. Now it makes me an uncle. Wait, wait, um, hold on a second. It makes you an uncle, but were you also involved in the bachelor party? Because if you went to Vegas, then you're the three best friends that anyone could have. I've been dying to work that into <laughs> something all day today. So uh, did you throw him a bachelor party? Or? Um, it, they had like something small going on, but I wasn't really a part of that. It's, oh, okay. it's yeah you decide to go to synagogue that day fair enough it's all good yeah it's all good. yeah so one day I decided to go the pictures later go it's all good. synagogue right but but now, now what about what what do you think the difference is and and again from the application of like of your spiritual journey why do you think that certain people were able to stick around you know did you did you find a thread through that versus the people that just it didn't work out for whatever reason did you find some sort of like now you're talking about being an uncle and that sort of thing is there, a, is there a spiritual component to this? Is there a fulfillment with it? I think the fulfillment is the longstanding friendship and the fact that like, you know, my friend Nikki and I kind of like had similar interests in like metal and that sort of thing. And somehow like they got into it before me, but they got yeah. big into yoga and Bikram and like yeah. all those things. She became an instructor. And for me, like I actually fell into yoga a couple of years after that. So I think it's interesting how the interests line up and, you know, they've, I've seen them go through changes. They've seen me go through changes. And I just think there's just basic human connection there that is just infinitely valuable. And I have, I'm lucky to have a lot of friendships like that, where even if I don't talk to someone for like a year and a half, like, it's just like, I just pick up where we left off. It just feels natural and it feels like no time oh. it passed at all. Why do you think, why do you think you have that with certain people? I mean, this is really interesting to me because I think sometimes, and, and again, we're, we're markedly, we're easily, you know, we're joking around about this because, you know, I had to pull your chart and I'm like, you know, I joked around that I was in the middle of a high school foray about the time you were born. And what's interesting to me about this is, is we're generationally, like we're two different generations, but you know, the things that I learned from like friendships and that sort of thing. And I, I listen, my, you know, my best friend in high school, if you walk through the door today, I'd give him a hug. Like I, I just would, like, I, I miss the guy. We had so much in common music, you know, a lot of the same, you know, pairing similarities, but we just naturally grew apart. You know, he made a full-time commitment to being creative and, and, you know, in art and, and, media design and marketing and that sort of thing. And I went for the dollars for a while. Like I, I had that, you know, work for a publicly traded company, all that other stuff, you know, now then when I, I run into him again, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm a developed medium. And I I'm starting to do shows all over the place. He's like, Oh, well, you know, you're going to be you. And I'm like, in a sense, I could have been insulted, but I wasn't because I, he just knew me well enough to be, he wasn't being dismissive. He was being accepting in the capacity he could be accepting. So now I have good friends and I work with them and we talk about crystals and astrology and you know we do deep dives on consciousness and and you know develop classes together. I mean my best friends are colleagues. But I I still miss that I want to sit around and play Mario Kart until our thumbs bleed, eat a pizza, you know, <laughs> drink now would be you know diet soda or water. 
unsweetened iced tea. Thank you very much. And but the conversation would be sometimes I crave that piece of it. Do you find that maybe you keep those people because you want to be able to go back to that, you know, Halicion days of, of being able to be like, yeah, I'm not going to have, I, we're going to, we're going to play till the sun comes up. Right. I have certain friendships for sure that definitely fulfill like that sort of part of me, which is always attached to just like the camaraderie of like playing super smash and just like getting really upset over nothing. And yeah, it's just laughing it off. Um, and it's amazing that that stuff, because we're millennials, like we're always going to go to that sort of thing. Like yeah. every once in a while, I can text a friend, and be like, do you want to play smash? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's like, and I only so, got 20 minutes, but let's play. Right. Isn't yeah, that also so, part of it as well, where you, you know, where you genuinely are just like, I wish I could do this all day, but I got, I got this project, you know, have you been, have you been thwarted before where you're like, you know, oh no, I, I, I can't do this because I've got so many other things I've got to do. Um, not really. Cause they have so many other things they have to do. So it kind of just works out. You know, the weekend is our oyster, so to speak. Oh, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool when you think about it, when you, when you've got the dynamic of being able to you know, still set aside that time. I think that's great. I think that's great. So what, what kind of spiritual adventures do you want to go on? What do you think are the things that will, will help you kind of take yourself to the next level? Because as much as we're, we're talking about kind of that evolution of like self-experience and that sort of thing, I definitely want to dive into the spiritual journey part of it with you, because that's something that always kind of stood out for me from the first time I met you, however long ago. And your thought process, like how do you approach your spiritual journey? What are the things you think you need or the things you've learned? And then what do you think the experiences are moving forward that you're going to need? So, I mean, I kind of like to start from the back and move to the front, right? So mm -hmm. I, I was in a period of time where I was just not living consciously and had a okay. codependent group of friends and that sort of thing. And found myself in a relationship that actually changed my life there were definitely good moments there were definitely tough moments i definitely had my part to play and accept full responsibility for that you got to do a deeper dive than that what type of relationship was it what'd you learn from it so i would say it was like my first real like legitimate relationship like you know my psychologist at the time was like congratulations you made it into the big leagues and i'm like i'm ready they were and worth it right yeah, they were. And so like, I got to experience the honeymoon period, the period afterwards where things kind of get a little crazy, and mm -hmm. just working stuff out. Um, and it was definitely just my teacher communication was not my strong point. And neither was like conflict resolution. So I couldn't really effectively bring those things to the table. At the okay. time. Huh. Um, and so this got deep really quick, forth. by the way, everybody yeah. listening was like waiting for this podcast to take off. They're like, are they going to talk about Slipknot for Christ's sake? Like, okay. Yeah. Now you're getting somewhere. So you identified some weaknesses that you had to, you had to work on, but you realized that this relationship was the teacher that you were looking for. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So and yeah, keep going. So you know, in hindsight, just to tie that up with the bow, like, I, it's really helped me and actually it's partly like the catalyst for sending me on this journey. And so like, we're still friendly to this day and talk about that kind of stuff sometimes. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, so, and you know, even in the, in the cross like generational thing, I mean, I still do talk. I mean, not often, not inappropriately. I mean, there, there's rules when you get married, how, how you connect with people and, you know, all that. So you can't just slide into their DMs as the kids say. But, you know, you, you run into them and you, you, you catch them for 20 minutes in the grocery store and you, you kind of do that perusal catch up and you don't get too deep, but you know they're okay. You know, and there's people that are, have been in my life where, you know, they, they had to go on for whatever reason and vice versa. I had to go on too, that I just want to make sure they're okay. And Facebook, I think, how do you, I mean, you've lived in a world where your entire adult life has had Facebook, right? You've had social media, you know, where me, I mean, there was still, I mean, we had to do some old fashioned stalking. Am I right? Or am I right? 
50 year olds like like general like i just said that and like half of the people listening were just like oh shit yeah i knew i could drive past i knew what he was driving i knew you know like there are people that you know they did facebook stalking is nothing compared to the cloak and dagger stuff that would go on otherwise but you would you know you've had that luxury of kind of knowing where you stand you don't have the what if if they block you or they don't friend you or they don't answer your your messages you kind of know where you stand how do you think that that kind of access has helped you or hurt you from in terms of like working on yourself um well hurt me as far as that goes it's like how that stuff is engineered to be psychologically addicting and mm. it just changes the social dynamic people as much as we're connected sometimes like you know, conversation can just be people liking a comment. And I'm like, this is not, this isn't like communication. Oh. I'm not really getting anything out of this. But oh, look at you, you grow know, up with that communication the, thing again. Two for two there, Mitch. Keep going, brother. But you Amen. know, like they've done experiments, with, you know, on rats, like, you know, like <laughs> this kind of stuff is engineered to be as like addicting, much like casinos, like where they pump the air full of oxygen and make you feel, you know, doped out on like air so you feel more like ready to gamble and throw your money away so th this is the same type of like neurological circuit that every single living thing has i mean maybe mainly mammals but you know th yeah, but, the but, point but is it like with, it has to do with social acceptance right has to do with the great sociological experiment that comes along with this where on the human you know side, my yeah. generation north of 50 and i can't believe i just said that everybody but you know that that north of 45 north of 50 it's like when somebody like drops you and it unfriends you or whatever, you just literally look at it and go like, I got so much bigger issues, right? Or yeah. your generation, how does Oof. your generation look at that kind of unfriending, blocking? Um, yeah, I just actually made like a moody like Instagram post that nice I, work. Uh, um, but I actually waited until after I did some restorative yoga. And so like I was able you have a to process. do a, uh, you have a process. Yeah. I was able to do it more neutrally where it's just like, yeah, it's such a disconnected world where people just say, Oh, well, I have the luxury of, you know, 10 other people, like 10 other people that are talking to me. So like, you're not important. And like, yeah. you know, the common advice from other people, my age is just, Oh, don't let it get to you. But it's like, I'm sorry, but I've tried to do that. It gets to me because I'm a human being. We're well, all human talk, beings. Yeah, let's talk about that. Where like my generation was able to, you know, we would be like, next time I see that one, I'm gonna, ba, 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 ba. you know, there was a kind of swag to it. What a bravado. Yeah. Where now you're in internet bravado. But what's really interesting is uh, talk about your process. You said something really interesting there about doing restorative yoga. Like, how do you step back and get perspective? Like that situation, you know, you talk about the restorative yoga. Is that something you do often or are there other things that you do to help you process? I've developed a whole toolkit based off of bouncing around from mentor to mentor over the last four years. Here so, we go. Here we go. You know, things ended up not working out in that relationship for one thing or another. And, you know, it, it had already started me in this trajectory. So I found somatic body work type Okay. Approaches like similar to Reiki. Have you heard of heard of Traeger? No, no. Well, well, walk us through Traeger. What does that What does that look like? What's so, the philosophy? It's a lot of micro movements and micro adjustments and a little bit oh. of energy work that you use to loosen up the muscle tissue to get access to the fascia. And the whole ethos was developed by this man named Milton Traeger, who went to Esalon College, which okay. is a pretty big, big name like school in California, where a lot of massage people came from so his okay. principle is created yeah, cranial, it, like yeah. people studied with him and under him and created cranial sacral roll thing like there's a bunch of sub modalities that spun off of this so interesting i met what would be my first mentor or one of my first mentors like in the spiritual side and he basically was a licensed massage therapist yogi and got into uh, traeger and reiki and created his own modality. So I would go to him quite often. And he ended up uh -huh. becoming a mentor of mine. And so that was my plug to get into shamanism, to get into yoga, to get into like Vedic astrology at the time. And so like, that was sort of the nexus point. And he was my first mentor and dare say he's one of my good friends to this day. 
and, well, and, and him and his partner as well. So, and, and doesn't that also allow you, I mean, you know, being able to have those access and, and when you say mentor, and again, I, I kind of get the theme of where, you know, this conversation is really going. I mean, full, full disclosure, everybody, I'm like, you know, okay, Mitch, we're going to, we're just going to start talking. He goes, uh, oh, okay. So kind of like one of your classes, Brandon, exactly. Anyways. So that whole thing though, is there a generational gap? Like, is he 18, you know, 15, 25 years older? Like, no, he was uh, 65 at the time. So he was like a full Saturn return ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah. So that, well, that's, that's still mentorship level, right? In terms of like what we think of in terms of yeah. that. Um, why do you think he appealed to you? Like, like, did you find yourself fitting into his paradigm or did you find him kind of trying to meet you where you were at to bring you along? <laughs> great oh question, right? Yeah, this is a great question. I think we met each other where, where we were at because I was wound up yeah. tight. Like, you're like a fist. You're just constantly like that. And so like it took six months to learn how to like loosen my leg so you could move it. And I realized, oh, for me, because I'm clenched, I need to send half a brain impulse to my leg to yeah. say loosen. And I'm like, oh. it took me a while to figure that out. Um, and then the one thing we always wrestled with until, until more recently is just my back, of my neck was always tight and you could just could not get my head. I could not get my head huh. to loosen up. So here I am. So you were a project tight. to him. Yeah. Here I am wound up tight. Here he is like in his, in his vibe, right? Like just, very instinctual, like picking up on the energy, energy worker in his own in his own right too. And so, the hand meets the fist, and we got a turkey. <laughs> kind of like that. The hand meets the fist, and it's a turkey. Kind of like that. Yeah. I just don't, made that don't, up. don't tell any of the grade school teachers that we have because this is the ultimate turkey. You put the <laughs> hand down, you start to draw it, and then you kind of go from there. Uh, it's funny that that gives me an opportunity to talk about a mentor I had who was a, um, Qigong master. He was an acupuncturist. Um, he actually ran, um, he ran the, the mind body wellness program for the state of New Mexico. Like he was, he was, he was really embedded there. Um, he was from my area. So when he would went to semi-retirement, he moved back here and that sort of thing. And that's when I met him. And it's funny where you're like, oh, yeah, you're so wound up or whatever. He pointed out to me, you know, and he, he talked about he taught me a lot about energy, because when I first got into this, I was so wound up. I would just read everybody. I was just, a lot of unhealthy, non-boundary behavior that had good intention. Like it wasn't like I was trying to hurt anybody or myself. But what I was doing was I was just like being like this energetic BDE everywhere I went. And it was, it, it got tiring for me. It got tiring for the people around me. And I probably burned some people during that time. And he pulled me aside. He goes, you're, you're talented as all get out, but you have no control over your energy. And that's when we started to do Qigong work. That's when we started to work with acupuncture. That's where he's like, these are some serious meditations. Like the, and I teach it to my classes now about evening your energy. It's like, you know, it's the peanut butter exercise where you, visualize moving all of this energy that comes in through your crown that's you know creative energy god energy uh, spirit energy whatever you want to label it when you when you have that gift and you haven't figured out its purpose or how to control it you're all over the place he not a medium a medium didn't teach me this a medium was too busy looking at me going if this guy gets good i, I got too much competition as it is that's how most mediums looked at me he was the first person that looked at me and just said, you're a human, like you're, you're still this like charismatic boy that just wants to do good everywhere, but you don't do good because you're swinging this energetic cat everywhere. And he finally said to me, he said, I can't go down to where you are because I can't hold a candle to you. You know, he got a reading from me. He goes, you did this best reading I've ever had in my life. And then he said, well, thank you very much you know, that, that fed into it. And he goes, and I'm also realizing that's the worst thing I could say to you because your energy. And then we started talking and we just started grabbing coffee and then it just grew from there. And I love Ed. I mean, you know, Ed's one of those guys that just, he really pulled me out of my own way to say, don't you see what we see here? 
you know, and, and do you feel like that mentor kind of really, really helped you through that? Yes. I went through the same exact sort of thing. We've had very similar conversations and it, it's almost identical to like your scenario where it's like, yeah. you have so much energy. He's, he's like, your brain is like the engine of, of a Ferrari, but you have like the brakes of like a Toyota. That's about, that's incredibly accurate, by the way. That is ridiculously <laughs> accurate. But, uh, uh, well, cool. Well, you know, I think there's so much more to this energetic, you know, energetic mentorship growth type of thing. And, and I love hearing about your journey because it's not just one thing, you know, it's also being able to kind of like pull out, like, where do we go with, with finding ourselves? Where do we go with, with, you know, did, did you ever think that like working with a mentor like that was just going to be a pain in the ass? You were like, why, why, why am I going to deal with this? Um, I just think I wasn't ready to do the work. I don't know if I looked at it as, as like being a pain. I think I, I went from being asleep to awake. And oh. that was a gradual process, you know, versus living unconsciously and just having a good time and just living for the party and, you know, mm-hmm. refusing to grow up, right? Um, but it'll be a choice for us to I get do. it. I yeah. get it. Yeah, so, so I would say that I don't know, but it, it was highly influential. And I think I was just at the right place at the right time to uh, be ready for it, you know, so, in my life. Not to say that it happened at random. I obviously chose to go down that path. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, you know, the, the, t- the right teacher shows up at the right time. I mean, it just, yeah. it just naturally happens. And you may take five things from that teacher. You might take 50 things. You might be able to apply them all at once, or it might take time to unfold. I mean, I still, and I, I had a very um, well-known teacher at one time, um, and he, he just kind of sat me down in the middle of a, of, a, of a class. It was an online class, and it was small. It was, it was really kind of like people that were super serious about what we were doing, and it was doing um, criminal investigation work, like missing persons, that sort of thing. And he said to me, he said, you're going to be loved and hated if you keep this up and i'm like why and he goes well the talent's there that's not the conversation the conversation is is you got to work on your table side manner well in a reading my table side manner is hey you're here for the brandon show here we go like okay you entered in but to an officer who doesn't believe in any of the crap you're dishing out right there it's a totally different thing he goes so you got to work on that so it was like my awareness went up tenfold when i had teachers that cared enough to say oh let's recalibrate you you know, not, I'm not going to deal with you, but I'm going to recalibrate you. Yeah. So l- let me ask you this question. We use the word awaken. What do you think the difference is between awaken and woke and wokeism and all of that new trendy um, words that are out there? I think like the wokeism stuff is part of like outrage culture in a way. Um, yeah. Where it's like, how dare you do this? Like, and you know, a lot of it's well founded. I certainly came from that background, but I just, you know, through having pull, like arguments with people and like usually just not doing a good job of doing it, I just sort of, yeah. you know, just fell out of it. And then I had friends who were just in all different spectrums. So I think that kind of prevented me from getting sucked into it too much because you know, here I am at like I'm gonna be 33 in May, and I'm right. just like this is all just checkers. Like I'm flipping the board over and walking away. There's enough, enough of this stuff. Whereas like awakening is like becoming aware of all this stuff, being able to yeah. see the games that we play as human beings, like in like finance, media, like, you yeah. know, politics, like it's, I, and you know, obviously I have political points of view, but at the end of the day, I just see it as like something that we get sucked into and it becomes a huge part of identity. And it's like, it can be part of it, but like, that's not, that's not like the whole, you know, there's yeah. so much more to it. And, you know, while we focus on things that are different, we focus on the reasons we disagree with people. Like, I think it's much more meaningful to focus on what we connect with, even though we're yeah. different people. And, and I think you're really to me, like that statement. Yeah. That's what awakening is, is discovering, Hey, you know, I have my point of view. I'm open to discussion. I'm open to my opinion changing. Yeah. I have my biases at the end of the day. But so what? Hey, man, how's it going? Like, 
What do you yeah. want to talk about? Like, you want to play some music? Like, that's the stuff. That's where human happens. When you're yeah. like arguing and stuff, that's human, but it's not. It's not the bright, the right side of. Being yeah, it's like it's, it's like what are you actually side. fighting for? What are you actually fighting for? It's funny. Penny and I had this conversation, and I, I you know, about uh, the Ukraine war, and one of the things that I think are are just missing right now from like the Korean War, World War II, a little bit. I mean, we kind of knew yeah. the danger we were up against. Korea, eh. but Vietnam and then the Gulf War had anti-war movements against them. There doesn't seem to be an anti-war movement anymore. And I think that's subjected to wokeism to be like, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to disestablish my, I'm going to disassociate myself from it. So it doesn't exist in my world. Mm. And you don't face it. I would say that, you know, like the wokeism actually is pretty like, you know, sympathetic towards like the war in, in mm. my experience and just my understanding of yeah, but it's having not that background war though. It's not anti-war. What happens though and I, I get crucified. I mean, crucified on on yeah. on blog pages because I I don't seem to I because I pick a side because well don't you know Ukraine did this well don't you know Russia did this and don't you know that NATO does that where the wokeism is is this information overload of contradictory things where you don't assimilate it to say but at the end of the day I still have to make a choice. It's like analysis paralysis. Wokeism has an analysis paralysis to it, where it's if I can just find another thing to throw in front of, you know, in front of you while you're chasing me, then you'll never get to the real problem, right? Yeah. Where where the anti-war kid in my high school that sat down and started singing, you know, give peace a chance in protest, um, stood for it. And even at the time, I'm like, boy, this kid's like freaking out there. I miss that guy because that guy, for right or wrong, he picked a lane. And, and he think, stuck with it. Well, he stuck with it. But that's the fear of the wokeism where it's like, I don't want to be stuck on anything. I don't want to get pinned down. No way. I'm not going to do that. And in a way, you even see politicians do a level of wokeism where, oh. you know, Mr. Mr. Senator, you know, you said this once upon a time and then they just gaslight you or they, you know, they they barrage you with a whole bunch of other things that have nothing that they, they subject change. They, you know, they 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 formulate something. So our conditioning has allowed us to never get to the actual awakening and woke is actually in the way. That's just that's just my opinion, how I see it from yeah. my generation. It's interesting to me. I just see it as like an over investment in political identity and then like you got the other half of people who are just like apathetic and like yeah. that's not it's not entirely their fault it's the world we live in you know um, right social media like conditions our emotions it's just like you know it's short circuit we're like rats on crack basically you know where it's just like constantly scrolling oh let me let me go and swipe a bunch on like dating apps and i'm a hypocrite because i've used them a lot to varying degrees of success, but like, I'm starting to realize that it's engineered to make men feel terrible about themselves. And meanwhile, there's studies coming out saying that eight percent women find eight percent of men on these apps attractive. Eight, eight percent. And 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 what percentage of men find women attractive on on those apps? I think it's a much higher percentage, but well, it's also course, like because men men are just I mean men are looking for the aesthetic thing of like. You know, whether it's it's body type, body shape, uh, you know, how you put yourself to it, whether you want to see yeah. yourself as a simple one or the goddess one or the whatever. Right. Oh, God. It's yeah, it's bad. Um, and it, it's like, OK, I mean, you know, lucky for me, I've developed a sermon, but it takes a lot of like trial and error to like meet someone that you actually like can connect with on those things where it was like, you know. I remember taking an NLP course. I never finished. Oops. Mm. Um, and the guy's like, the present is where life happens. And, yeah. and it's like, well, okay. Then like people don't approach people anymore. So why don't we just approach each other, have a conversation. And guess what? I'm also going to try to not have an agenda when I approach you. I got to witness that in person where I was a person who had no agenda talking to random females. We're going to grab a like cup a of coffee. Thing. The only thing I'm going to promise is a cup of coffee, right? 
And then, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I need somebody that's more aggressive or, you know, whatever. And it's, you know, I, I've never had to touch a dating app. I, I just, you know, and I, I don't know that it would ever be something that I would say, oh my gosh, that's how I'm going to find the person. I've been involved with so many astrology classes and relationship work and all that other good stuff. And I'm here to tell you that conscious men don't think that that's the way to go. It truly is the, you know, the old fashioned way and consciousness. And you said it best earlier when you were like being present, being in the here and now lets me use my faculties where we're kind of that social media thing. When we were talking about, you know, the, the Facebook likes or the, the, you know, the hearts on IG or any of that other stuff, you know, IG stands for instant gratification. So if you love my stuff, then we're <laughs> best friends. Right. Right. So, so then you know, give me the real, give me the part where, what are you really trying to do during this screening process of this? Instead of getting the real, you have to interpret, well, it took her 45 minutes to return that text. Is she with somebody or is it, but like your mind goes, has got to go crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's something that gets dug up and actively just working through those sort of things where it's like, okay, well, this mindset no longer serves me. It's actually causing there it pain. Is. And it's not the person, it's the way I'm responding to the scenario. And what's crazy to me is that like, you know, I don't think that psychology necessarily has acknowledged that neuroplasticity is a thing where guess what? Your mind's changeable. Is it, is it difficult? Yeah. It's incredibly yeah. difficult. It takes a lot of effort to do habit changing. You have to like, and you have to really check your narrative and like, well, really you need CBT to like get into that well, perspective. Listen, I, I don't mean to sound all Joe Rogan here, but you know, what you're really talking about is your, you know, your patterns really matter. You know, what, you know, one time it's a, it's an occurrence three times. It's a pattern, you know, 10 times it's, it's, it's a redesign. 30 times yeah. you're able to right so yeah you're, you're i mean but what do you pick and choose what you're going to reprogram yourself i mean you're really talking about reprogramming what's worthwhile to reprogramming because whether you're on a social media app a dating app even even like when you go to file something in your health insurance or your taxes or whatever you there's like a logic that that predictive index that ai conversation that's happening to us that we're a, a part of how do you choose to break away from that? How do you choose to be like, that's not how I'm going to do it. And then how do you cope with the non-success rate again? Right. Um, number one is being aware of the emotion. Usually when there's an emotion, let's say I feel angry. There's actually several layers of thought and sub thought underneath that. And you can only really develop that skill through yeah. practice and like mindfulness, whether it, you know, sometimes it's not even a person who meditates. Sometimes it's a person who goes on like an AM walk like every day. And it yeah. just has that space to decompress from like the nonsense and the constant hamster on the wheel thing. That's just the way the world is. So it, it's identifying the emotion. And oftentimes it's like, at a certain point, it'll start to feel painful enough until you're like, I got to do something about this because this does not feel good. Yeah. And I think, Often it took me four oh, years of self development, yeah. bouncing around from mentors, messing with all these spiritual practices to start to actually get with the program. Because I was right. when I started, I was always like, "This guy's got the cure. This guy's got the cure. This practice has the cure." Guess what? You know who's got the cure? Ding 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 ding. So ding. you know enough with like giving my power away to people who are like holding Vedic astrology over my head, saying, Whoa. "Oh, oh yeah." Go ahead, keep going. Let her yeah. rep say it. Wow. Yeah. Well, like, well, listen, I, I've said this a thousand times. Anybody that deals in absolutes is just selling you something in this spiritual yeah, and, work. So I, I will off the cuff, like plug your plug your class because that was the first thing that you told us is anyone who deals in absolutes run for the hills. And that really resonated with me because, you know, I was wrapped up in that stuff. And, you know, I'm, I could easily say, oh, it didn't benefit me. No, it did. It did. There was right. definitely some valuable things. Because it's um, where you were at. It's where you yeah. were at. Right, yeah. And, yeah. So one day I just started feeling angry. I just didn't know why. I didn't know why for like a while. 
And, you know, it started to be like, well, you know, I had my chart read and this was, I was supposed to feel better from like this health thing by now. And I, you know, it came and went and nothing happened. And so like, I felt angry and um, found this free shamanic meetup group in like the neighboring town. I was in, living in like New Jersey at the time. And it's ended up being run by this dude who is like a fifth generation, like Peruvian shaman. His grandfather is like a, the was best. a very I gotta famous you. shaman. And so we talked and much like most mediums and people who are into conscious stuff, like he was into numerology, tarot, like all these things, right? So mm -hmm. he goes, to me, shamanism is a logic. It's not, to, to other people, it's oh, a religion. I love that. I love that. Um, shamanism is a logic. Yeah. And it's, it's true. And to me, like that tickled the very analytical side of my brain. So, but he continued to say is I bounce around from shaman to shaman in Peru quite a bit. And mm. they always, like their design is to hold power over you. But meanwhile, he's studying Taoism and is like, you know, the person I'm studying under is told me anyone could be a shaman. And so at first I'm like, oh, I'm a shaman. And then I started to realize, no, 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 that's not the message. The message is that I like no one has a corner in the market of spirituality. If anyone does like, boom, you know, boom. Yeah. You know, it's, boom. it's funny because I had, um, I had a mentor, uh, I had a teacher it, really recently and he has since passed away, but he had this wonderful life where he was a Catholic priest kind of left the priesthood after he went and did mission work in Peru, became a shaman. And he was, you know, the, our conversations weren't lessons. Like I want to teach you this today. It was more of being able to say, this was my experience. And he told me all of these wonderful things about things. He also talked about his failures. He talked about how he didn't reach his potential in a lot of ways because he got hung up on stuff, but he kept moving forward. That was the thing I can, I can say about the guy. And one of the things that he brought out in me was understanding like you have been bouncing around like a pinball and you look at it as a flaw. You know, I'm like, why can't I just get narrow and do this? Well, in my chart, which by the way, we're going to take a look at your chart next. Um, my chart really kind of gives me this little bit of squirrely energy that allows me to bounce around and be creative all the time. I got to have a lot of tabs open. That's how I'm built. And he said, instead of thinking, okay, you've got to have multiple tabs open. But if you get it down to five tabs, what's your tab level to work with efficiency? Now, this is an eight, you know, a nearly 80 year old man who understood how computers worked enough to tell me you got too many tabs open. And then he said to me, he go, and I was singularly focused on something and was perseverated on it. And he said, you, you need more tabs open. Like he knew enough to say, hmm. get another tab open. I really connect with that because, you know, Gemini, ADHD, um, 90s child, millennial. Like, so a lot of tabs open. I can think oftentimes most of my stress suffers from having too many tabs open or from trying to singularly yep. focus on multiple tabs. So it's yeah, like to be like, I'm going to knock know. this off like a checklist instead of going, oh, I need the one open so I can go to the four so I can go back to the two. And I'll pay attention to five for a little while because ultimately I'm going to dump all this into three and I'll go back and yeah. forth between four for a little while. So then one will make a lot of sense. Yeah. Like, by the way, if that makes one... sense to you, welcome to the club. Yeah. Right. It's totally there. Um, totally yeah. Cool. I think, I think ADHD is something that's probably been around for thousands of years, most likely. Um, and number two, like convers having conversations with people with ADHD, like initially I felt would feel like self-conscious because I would just want to talk a lot and talk about a yep. bunch of different things and not everyone's on that wavelength. So it kind of drowns people out, but you know, through just being mindful about it, I think I've gotten better. Yeah. And it, part of me, you know, it feels self-conscious then like, why can't I just stick to like, a more continuous conversation but to me it's like yeah. the reason i can't is because i see all these parallels between these various things that merge into one nexus point well do you think too and this is the, the, the this is a good break because we you know we got to get to the rest of us or we can talk yeah. all day which is why you'll be back you know the part of it though about adhd into consciousness 
you know, it's, it's, and I know this because I've worked with kids with ADHD. My kids have been on this, you know, paradigm conversation here for a while. And the conversation for me is, is this is a superpower. You're going to have a spring loaded ass. What are you going to do with it? Not let's calm you down, you know? Yeah. And, and let's it's focus. like, well, well, how did you think you overcame that? Like, did you rely on the medication? I don't need to know the HIPAA violations, but was it something where you had to kind of figure out what the right combination of activity, maybe medication, maybe meditation, maybe walks, maybe whatever. How did you work that, that combo platter, if you will, to get you to a point where, oh, I can, I can eat properly and get what I need out of this. How'd you get there? Through a lot of trial and error. I mean, I've definitely always pushed to do things the natural way. Sure. At a, at a certain point, I was medicated. Um, it, it helped, but I don't think I really liked the way I felt. And I still have a bias where it's like every time I've thought about it, I'm just like, I don't really want to mess with the side effects. Yeah. And plus, you know, now through like the Traeger experience with my buddy, um, I learned about neuroplasticity. And so like I'm insistent sure. on what the books know is helpful, but it's incomplete. The mind is much more plastic. Um, and so to me, I've learned discipline through things like yoga, through things like making mistakes, through working through like rock climbing, which has been an amazing game changer for me, for my life, for my mental health, for my body. What a rush, huh? Um, yeah, it's just, if you can deal with those stressful situations where you're just like holding on to something like that, with like your feet barely on something. I'll tell you, I do not I'll have that what. body type. Just to let you know, thanks for the invite. <laughs> I'll, I'll make lunch. Come down, come down <laughs> by two. I'll make sure you're fed. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, I, so, you know, but I will go near a stream and meditate the shit out of that. I'll tell you that right uh, now. Listen, see, that's where you and I connect because that's my favorite thing. Find a nice big rock in the middle of a river and just sit there. I was when doing I was that in, in Sedona, when I was in Sedona, the temperatures, I mean, it was early November temperatures had like really dropped so it was like really cold at night and during the day it was like mid 50s like it was nice it yeah. was you know and sweatshirt with that sun course. with that sun it's 60 degrees in the East yeah, Coast. it's it's great but there was this rock in the middle of the river and i'm like oh, i just want to just float out there and jump on there and sunbathe and then i'm remembering i'm with a lot of people that could see me do the float to the sun and i'm like ah, i don't, I don't want to do that i, I totally go in self-conscious but but I will tell you, though, that sitting next to healing waters was a game changer. So anyway, so we brought up astrology here in a second, and we're going to break for just a minute, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the most interesting thing about Mitch's chart coming up next. I'm Conscious Medium, Brandon Ross, and look, I've written a book, and here's three reasons why you should get this book. Let's start by saying you have a high price quality education, and you like intelligent conversation, journeys of the mind and the soul, and you're really good looking. Those are three reasons to get it right there. You love that new book smell, you miss it. it kind of, it's, it's a hint of like, of like wood burning, fireplace, and beach all at the same time. And there are 220. There are 211 reasons to get it, really. That's how many pages it is. All she had was yogurt and cantaloupe. <laughs> you see, there was a hair buried under the stage. Oh, oh, and every time a bell rings, you're gonna love that one. And my dad just sat there and said, why don't you just play poker for a living? <laughs> it's all about the stream of consciousness, I say. The stream of consciousness. Oh, and wait till I tell you all about Sister Mary Knuckle Pants. Oh, look, a rainbow in the middle of a reading. Unlike George, even. The Three of Cups are meant to be a celebration, I tell you, a celebration. Listen, I'd love to give you a money back guarantee, but that's not how books work. For a couple of bucks, you can read my basically life story about how I became a medium and how I do the work that I do today. I've been a professional medium for over 10 years, and these are stories about growing up as a medium, becoming a medium, having discernment, and understanding what my purpose and my path is. 
This is a great read, everybody. If you like spiritual journeys, this one's fun. If you like comical situations in which a kid gets out of stuff left and right and tries to figure out things using his intuition, that's fun. If you're into having people learn from their lessons and grow from them, this book is for you. All of those things, this book is for you. You can find it at Amazon and great retailers everywhere. I can't wait to have you come along my journey. So I'm going to give you the heart tap to remind you to care and love for one another and to simply keep going. That's what this book reminds you of. Read it today. All right, we're going to dive Look in. Look at that. <laughs> I know, right? This is a hot chart. All right, we are back. And this is the most interesting thing about Mitch's chart here. Um, Mitch, you know, we've had this really great conversation about generational um, challenges and, and becoming aware in, in the difference of generations. I think it's been a very valuable conversation. Well, when I see your chart, it starts to make a little bit of sense as to why it is that you have some of these stressors and strains going on. You have two really... You actually have three really in-your-face placements here. Um, first of all, being a Gemini with a Taurus rising. And of course, your moon is in Leo. So you've got this nice mix of air, uh, earth, and then, of course, fire into this. So your challenge is almost always going to be the pliability. It's funny how you were talking about that thing with the, with the you know, with your brain and the neuroplasticity. Because in your knowledge is where in the ninth house, you have Neptune, Uranus conjunct. You have a wider conjunct with Neptune into um, Saturn. And by the way, that is actually one of the call signals that that conjunct of um, Saturn and Neptune of social political change. So you're kind of at the crossroads of this. And this Saturn thing is you know, and again, you and I talked about this a very long time ago, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school here. Your interesting part about this is that Saturn is sitting in your 10th house. So from a career standpoint, you're going to be looked at as the mentor. You're going to be the person that's looked at as the person that can grow things. Well, right next door in conjunct with Neptune in the ninth house is screaming teacher. It's screaming that you've got to kind of culminate all these things. That's why you're getting all these teachers. Right. This is why you you find you find things even with other people that are your peers. You learn from it. That's why we started out with the with the friendship thing. We went into the um, uh, went into the whole dynamic with the with the teachers and whatever. And then look at this Jupiter Chiron uh, junk in the third house. I'm sorry. What did you say was a challenge in your relationships? Communication. It's sitting right there. You had to figure out how to communicate because that's where the magic is. That's where you are your empathetic, true self. By the way, sitting there in this very awesome Cancerian energy, right? Now, with each one of the, uh, I'm taking a look at, oh yeah. So you've got Leo in the fourth. You've got, um, in the eighth, you are Sag, and in the twelfth, you're Aries primarily. But you have something really interesting in your twelfth house, which, by the way, this is the reason why you get spiritually. I'm going to use the word vindictive, but not in a revenge sort of way. You are very ardent when people bullshit you on spirituality, because sitting here in the twelfth house, you have Mars in Cancer, which is. They, they are, that is not friendly territory. You know, we talk about like Saturn going into Pisces and going, ah, well, the second worst is Mars going into Pisces, right? You are at the anoric, you are at the 29 degree. So your emphasis here is in like, you will not bastardize this for me. You will not give me a, a line of crap. This is the reason why now you've had some mentors do amazing for you. And some mentors just, out, you're, you're like 30 seconds of bullshit and you're out, right? Rivaled only by, and by the way, here's the up and down for you in the love life. 
You got Venus also in the 12th house at a 29 degree angle, which makes you a very tough love partner. You're either going to knock it out of the part, death to us part, or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm washing my hair. Just letting you know. That's how your chart sets up. But I'll tell you, though, when you match, there are going to be somebody that you can learn from because you're in conjunct with Vesta. And you're going to learn this on a level that you never thought possible. Like the person that you're going to connect with. And by the way, your box energy is huge here. Look at all the boxes for crying out loud. You got more boxing. You got more boxes than a moving company in your chart. Right? I mean, look <laughs> at it. You're like, square, you're like Square City. But that that Vesta Venus thing makes you an incredible partner when they can match you. So your biggest challenge is finding somebody that energetically matches you. Are they going to like the same activities? Are they going to like to do rock climbing? I don't know, but they'll like to be active. And when you're like, okay, well then we'll bite you and I bike together. I'm going to climb. You go sit and meditate. Okay, cool. That's what we'll do. Like you'll figure out that, that Aquarian energy thing as we go into the age Aquarius. And it's actually going to be really, really important for you you know, to find that. But this, I, I mean, the most interesting thing about your chart is your spiritual journey. It's right here. It's right freaking here. You're going to be a teacher. You're going to marry well, and you're going to call out bullshit. I mean, no pressure. <laughs> How about that, right? All right, cool. What, what do you think about what I just said? Um. I think it's a very interesting interpretation and it's interesting to just listen to. And as someone who like doesn't know much about this brand of astrology, it's very interesting absorbing that take. And you know, for me, it's, I like to marinate and chew my food. Right. So it's going to take some pondering to uh, think about like how that, you know, affects me moving forward, but it's well, definitely well, a great explanation. Look at that chart, man. Look at the shapes in there. That, that That's, that's what my brain keeps on seeing. It's just like, a square that's just like vibrating like profusely. Well, and, and you have, you know, yeah, your fixed cross is actually for your healing. You know, I have to tell you this, like your, you know, your Mercury is is in opposition to Lilith. And Lilith is the, is the moon with the cross underneath it, which is conjunct to Pluto. So this is like, you're going to marry kind of your best friend type of thing, but it's going to be somebody you can help and they're going to help you. But you are kind of in a, grand cross a fixed grand cross with your uh north and south node i mean your north node is aquarius which again that's another call symbol of a teacher because your north node in aquarius is about the greater good your mission is to move everybody forward you that's why you don't get hung up on petty bullshit it's because you're just like well does this matter at the end of the day is this going to matter in three years or 20 years like that's your parameter that's what makes you cut bait right the things that make you go back into to, to fight is when somebody's not doing it right. And you're like, oh, I got it. But look at, I mean, in all of your healing sits in communication, right? You got the Chiron return, which give or take, uh, how old are you now? 33? 32. 32. So you got about 15 to 16 years before you hit your Chiron return. But that's great, though, because you're going to find somebody between here and there. And you're going to be able to let them marinate. You know, your healing's going to be, You've got all of these things that allow you to like cultivate like a good person in your life, right? In the opposition, that seventh house with Pluto, Lilith, and then Juno, Juno is the, the, the sign of marriage. The person that you marry is going to help you heal all of that stuff that you're like, why am I like this? Kind of jealous, got to be honest, kind of nailed it. Welcome back to five good minutes. And this is the segment where 
I pepper Mitch with a whole bunch of questions, one right after another. I give him just enough time in order to think about it. And he has to tap into a stream of consciousness and answer it right away. Now, there's no real time limit associated to this. It's just a matter of of really kind of getting to know you and opening yourself up. And those that do really well with this are able to just like, okay, I'm just going to give you the first answer that comes to my head. And then other people trying to analysis paralysis. But in your chart, Mm. you're working on communication. Go big or go home. Thank you very much, Jupiter. All right. Are you ready to do this? Let's do it. All right, we're going to do five minutes on the clock here, and I'm going to probably blow that out of the water because that's what I do. All right, you ready? Yeah. First question up, what's your opinion of garden gnomes? Um, they're interesting and add a vibe to a uh, garden. I think that's full of crap. All right, so you're from another planet. What's the first thing you tell Earth how to fix itself? Um, put all the greedy people in jail. <laughs> what's your definition of greedy using capitalism and money to take advantage of others for your own personal gain what kind of tree are you going to come back as oak why first thing that popped in my head first thing you do with 10 million dollars um pay off all my friend's debt oh so you're like you're like an enabler you know that you know that four out of five lottery winners end up broke, right? <laughs> well, speaking of which, what's the last gift you gave somebody? A pair of shoes. A pair of shoes? Are you Jesse Owens? <laughs> the hell is that about? Shoeless Joe Jackson? That's pretty awesome, actually. Um, favorite sport and team? Rock climbing, no teams no teams so so basically team mitch um walk-up song movie fa- favorite movie song song you've ever heard the one that like you play over in your head when you're doing something i don't really have one um but Stop. to me like you ever watched the movie basketball of course oh my gosh real one big, of the, one, real one, big one fish. the best of all times basketball yeah, real- yeah. Yeah, real big fist the ska band that was playing at the stadium. Oh, totally good. That, What's your favorite ska band? Streetlight Manifesto. Nice. So my first drum teacher is a world famous ska drummer now. He is a reggae drummer, and he just uh, he used to teach me stuff in ska. And I'm like, I'm never gonna play this, and now I can't get enough of it. Can't get enough. No, of it's it. it's upbeat and happy, right? Like, oh that's my like gosh, the whole it's thing. like. You know, I'm having the worst day of my life, man. And they just like rock it because you got a skip beak in the, you know, in a two, in a two dub. Anyways, so uh, where are you going to go? What's one place in the world you need to get to before you leave your body? Either like the Great Pyramids or like the Himalayas. Oh, so you're going to go, you're going to double the answer. Okay. All right. Best job you've ever had, or at least the one you enjoyed the most. Um, I would say like producing podcasts with friends. Really? So how many, you know, give us something you got live active now so we can get people to clickbait on it. I'm actually going to start my own coming up shortly, but, um, the ones I did start, they're no longer, uh, in practice. So it's all learning stuff. It was all fun. Awesome. And, uh, I grew from doing that. Yeah, sure. I'll be a guest. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Who was your favorite president and why? I love this question. Who's my favorite president and why? <laughs> I don't think I have one. <laughs> this is my favorite question. I, why it, do you do you believe that there is a secular spiritual movement that could really kind of guide us? Like secular is in like the Sam Harris atheists or like but just uh, outside well, of general whatever religion. that looks like to you. Um, if omniism could become like the world's religion, I would be yeah. a big fan of that personally. What? Huh. I'm going to have to rephrase this. What is the most embarrassing thing that ended up being a blessing? <sighs> most embarrassing that ended up being a blessing. I have plenty of embarrassing things, but I don't know if any of them have a huge impact on on me. Like, 
spiritually or journey wise. All right. Well, I think they're all just good notes. I'll tell you the, the one that yeah, go I'll ahead. my favorite. I'll tell you my favorite. And um, one of my first mentors, favorite stories. I was a teenager volunteering at a hospital working for the painting department. And I was like an emo kid. So I showed up with like the huge hair, the side bang, the like stretched ears, like, you know, it just didn't look right. Um, And so like I'm painting in a bathroom and toilet paper dispenser is like made out of sheet metal and it's open. I accidentally back up onto it and I have a gash on my butt cheek. And apparently I was like, my ass, my ass. And then like I had to go to the ER to get stitched up at work. And this is a story that takes out every year. <laughs> so, so like once a year, like when you're with your, when you're, when you're with whoever, you end up talking about it. Like, as in like, remember the time you, you had an extra hole in your ass? I mean, I, I, I don't know how you present that, but there it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So what, if you could marry a fictional character, who would it be? Like who kind of has the archetype that Mitch would go? That's it. I'm settling. Is there any like semi spiritual adventurous character? Whatever. I, don't have a what, I mean, one. whatever. I, I mean, I was Katniss? I mean, was Katniss kind of kind of a spiritual leader? I never, I never really like dabbled in any of that stuff. Like Sorry. I'm the only one that ever looked at Jennifer. Like, like come on. I'm <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence's only fan. Stop. Come on. Cross generational here. It's one thing we can agree upon. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. you could have said Princess Leia. I you don't want to read your thoughts. No, no, no. I, I don't mind. It's just that, that was the question just like threw me off because I don't think about this. I things. know that's why. <laughs> so you're grounded in reality, Taurus Rising? Leo Moon? I mean, kind of makes sense. I'm grounded, makes- but also not, right? Like sometimes it can be like kind of pulled in between the two. Uh, isn't that the perfect thing isn't that the perfect thing well, all right when you find when you find balance when you find well, balance listen, star, that. star trek or star wars both oh god you are such a freaking millennial like this is wokeism <laughs> that answer is fucking science fiction wokeism right there no it's not because like my dad was exposing me to star trek when i was five and then i got into star wars as well right, right, right around the same time with my cousins and my grandparents so it's like I kind of had both schools, right? Well, it's not like I was asking you if it was Kirk or Picard. I mean, let me put you on that one. I mean, I think Picard is it is iconic for different reasons than Kirk. Kirk obviously got it You're started, so but I, like, I always grew up with Picard. You're so woke with that <laughs> answer. You're so woke. You don't want to offend Kirk because you don't want to upset the class. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So since we're still on the topic, the prequel trilogy or the postquel trilogy of Star Wars? Not the middle, not the middle three. Can't touch those. Those are gold. The first three or the last three? I think the first three did a better job with the story because capitalism didn't ruin Star Wars yet. Oh, okay. So you went that angle. Well, you know though, but I think. I think they did a. Re- I think they had too many. I think they had more throwaway characters in the first three. I I, th- I just think they do. <laughs> well, yeah, Jar Jar was kind of like he could have been a seriously minor character and gotten the point across. I understand his purpose, and I don't know. I don't get into the whole Jamaican, you know, stereotype thing. But even even the stuff with um, uh, you know, with Watto and and you know that entire you know, sect of people, like it was kind of like they were trying to convey the fact that there were just people in the world that were deadened to the nerve of the force, that they were only motivated by one thing. Um, I think they did a good job with that, whereas it elevated with the fulcrum being the middle three of that balance of like what you need to when you need it. And then in the final three, where the force really took over, where the energy really took over, and let's not forget the um, Benicio del Toro character, and I can never remember his name, where he sold out, where he sold out the empire, and then you know basically whatever he ends up being the criminal villain that in the first three movies, in the first three prequels, they were like the standard of how the world was working, but it was evolving, and then aha, it 
actually shows yin and yang, you know? So that's my argument as to why Star Wars as an arc is better than Star Trek because Star Trek kept taking all of the still good in their own rights. I get the reason why you'd say both, but it was man versus nature. It was man versus man. It was man. It was man versus the conflict. It was the classic literary conflicts all the time in Star Trek, yeah. where Star Wars always spoke to an arc. But that's just me. <laughs> no, know, but what, I, what I kind I of agree with that. I mean, I think Star Wars had a greater theme to it than Star Trek did, and Star Trek was a you know really some of the like traditional sci-fi you know in a, in a way where it kind of followed like the MacGuffin and like all the story elements oh, the MacGuffin, star wars great so word much other stuff yeah that, that well that's george relevant. lucas for you because george yeah. lucas also took the MacGuffin to indiana jones you know and then when he influenced uh things like back to the future and that sort of thing like when he would you know talk to zemeckis he's like well what are you chasing you know and he goes well i don't know it's back to the future you're chasing his identity so he doesn't get erased like uh, uh the stuff and everything in indiana jones we could have a whole podcast just talking about indiana jones and 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 that arc um but yeah he was always chasing something that he could never fully obtain and when he obtained it evil took it away every single time every single time evil took it away and when you look at it, what, what it always represents, if you just basically show a yin and a yang, it's like no matter how dark it is, you know, he's having his heart about to be ripped out. He still has this ounce of good because, you know, short round is still there and he's got to make it through for him. Boom, all of a sudden, then it, then it, it, the good starts to take over the bad again, you know, and it's just that cyclical thing of back and forth and that yin and yang. And that's something that George Lucas never gets enough credit for. He shows the human condition from the esoteric arc of good versus evil, where Star Trek is about survival of man, survival and thrival based on how we can assimilate and not assimilate. Both are important, but I think one is psychological and one is sociological. There it is. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I end up talking for most of the end of my podcast? I think I did. All right. So Mitch, listen, we're going to say goodbye now. So who do you want to give your heart tap out to? Who do you want to dedicate it to? All of the mentors that brought me to this very moment. That is freaking awesome. So guys, we're going to give the heart tap out to everybody to remind you that we love and care for one another. And Mitch is sending it out to all the mentors out there that are inspiring others every single day. It is doing this awakening work not woke work, but awakening work so we can elevate and climb to a higher level of consciousness. All right, guys, Conscious Medium, Brandon Ross. Mitch, thanks so much for being my guest. I know you'll be back. Thank you. And may I say, darling, you look super handsome today. Well, I'm glad I'm recovered. Thank you. This would be a really good time for Putin to swallow some crow and